And so I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Michael Donfrey. Come on up here, and we'll get you wired up. As uh, Dr. Stephen Steens has mentioned, my name is Mike Donfrey. I'm a vocational rehabilitation counselor for the VA hospital here in Seattle. And uh, Dr. Stephen Steens asked if I would do this, and uh, I really was uh, looking forward to this uh, day to meet every one of you and explain a little bit on a topic that uh, dealing with work, volunteering, and as well as school. So first of all, I want to mention, um, I know some of you will work with a vocational rehabilitation counselor and might not know what is a vocational rehabilitation counselor, how does one become a vocational rehabilitation counselor. And so I just wanted to briefly explain, most vocational rehabilitation counselors, at least the ones that are here tonight, have a, a master's in vocational rehabilitation counseling as well as nationally certified rehabilitation counselor which is a CRC as you can see there. So, This is the topic we're going to talk about. It's not just what you can contribute but how when you contribute you are actually enhancing your quality of life in the process. Volunteering non-paid work experience a lot of people say, well, I'm not getting paid. It doesn't have value. It actually does have value. It gives you an opportunity to interact with the community and give to the community. It also works on developing skills as well as the tolerance to get out and work. And it's also an opportunity for career exploration to kind of figure out and explore to see if this is something you might want to do, as well as an opportunity to just Evaluate your abilities, your skills, and your aptitudes so you can kind of get to know yourself because when you do come to a vocational rehabilitation counselor, we value your insight to who you are. And it's very helpful, obviously, if you have a good grasp of your abilities, your interests, your personality, your skills, and, and your work history. And this is a good site here, actually, if you want to figure out where can I volunteer, where can I contribute. I kind of know who I am, but I don't know where I might be able to best put that into the community. Well, you can check out this site, and it's everywhere nationwide. So wherever you are, it might be a tool that might help you. The importance of a higher education. One good resource I didn't put on here, but it might be worth mentioning, is Occupational Outlook Handbook. They actually have a government website you can check into that and actually put in different kinds of occupations and see what kind of education is required and what the future outlook of it is and the nature of the work. Is that something I can do with my capacity? So, but education, as a lot of people here know, has great value. And there's funding available for that. A lot of people don't think about that. They think, well, I can't afford it. But there's a VA vocational rehabilitation services if you have a service-connected disability. Tracy that will be speaking later today is State Rehab and uh, they have some resources available as well as financial aid that the school can help you with. I don't want to go too much into that but some accommodations you might want to think about is you might have extended time to take testing, maybe you want to tape record, you know maybe you need a modified place to take your test so they can help you with that with the uh, disability services at the college or university. Common barriers that you might face, well, at least it's been said in the literature that a lot of people will face, are mainly these. I started with the uh, disability and personal attitudes because I think that's, in a way, what we have the most control over. We can actually control that. It's easier to control your own attitudes than it is the attitudes of others. As well as transportation, we'll go into that. Losing benefits, that's a big concern. You know, you don't want to make your situation worse. Uh, employer attitudes, that's a big one. And, of course, job accommodation concerns and the ADA and other, other uh, legislation, key legislation and work incentives had tried to deal with a lot of these. Disability, strategy, understand the job seeker's vocational potential, your skills, your abilities. It's critical to understand your strengths because the number one reason an employer is going to hire you and the number one reason you want to be hired is because you're the best candidate. So understanding yourself your abilities and how that could be best utilized in, the, in your society, in your community. Understanding the employer's expectations, the in, environmental conditions, and the work culture. It's kind of tricky to do, you know, some of this. 
But if you have a placement service that's assisting you, such as a job development developer or placement specialist, say you're getting some assistance through the state or the federal program in helping you and working with you as a partnership to do that, they might be able to do a job site analysis and maybe I'll, time, I'll touch base on that. And that's where the last one comes in. Find a good job match and an intervention. It might be assistant technology would be the intervention. You know, most assistant technology, about 80% according to the Job Accommodation Network, 80% costs less than $500. And a big chunk of that don't cost anything. It's what everyone uses, calculators, envelope openers, all kinds of things. And I think I'm getting a little feedback here. Okay. Uh, transportation. That's important. If you can't get to work, what's, you know, that's a big problem. There's uh, ADA paratransit. If you can't use the regular publicized transportation services, you might want to apply for this. Usually due to a physical disability or a mental disability, you can't use a regular transit service. So you might qualify for ADA paratransit service. And a lot of the other services will have lifts, wheelchair tie-downs, security devices, you know. Uh, one big thing that might help with uh, transportation is, you know, self-employment, of course. Other things is what a lot of people use, ride sharing, uh, as well as selective job placement. You know, when you look for jobs that are located in areas that you can actually get to. Sounds quite simple, but sometimes is overlooked. Individual support, personal support which so many people use, friends, coworkers, and other available uh, resources. Job coach, for example, if you have an employment specialist that helps you with the job, maybe some people have a co-occurring disability, spinal cord, traumatic brain injury, and they have some difficulties maybe navigating the bus system, and they need some travel training. Vehicle modification. You know, there might be some funding available for that. It's worth checking into, especially if you tie it to an employment outcome and you're serious about that. The environment, I think we, we all know about that. Losing your benefits. Wow, that's a big one, right? How many people here get either SSD or SSI? Maybe you don't want to admit it, maybe you do? Okay. Maybe at one time you did? You know, that's, that's a big one. Did you know that you can work and keep your benefits? Did you know you can work and lose your benefits? Well, how in the world am I going to do that, right? Well. And you don't want to be worse off. That's why there's this program here through the Social Security Administration located in many counties called the Work Incentive Planning Assistance Program to actually enable you better to make informed choices about your work decisions. Would you be better or would you be worse? I put some new figures up here so you're aware of that. Uh, work incentive, some is called impairment related work expense. What is that? A lot of this stuff's going to be practical stuff you can take home and use. Okay, impairment related work expense. If you're using transportation, specialized transportation for example, and you pay out of your own pocket and you need it to get to work, to get home, and it's work related, and you have to pay out of your own pocket, you could probably report this to the Social Security Administration and they will take it into consideration. You know, to keep you below what's called SGA, substantial gainful activity, or your and keep or keep more of your SSI, supplemental security income. Okay, you can have like big discussion on this and I won't belabor too much in that, but I wanted to give you the uh, figures. Substantial gainful activity for 2008 is 940. After your trial work period, if you're underneath that, you know, you can keep your uh, payments. Maybe that's a good start. They set it up like this, you know, to get, motivate you, take away the disincentives, to get you to work. Maybe one day then you make the next leap, work full time and not get off these things and you don't need them, you know but you want to be in a better situation, obviously, so you need to make an informed choice and educated decision. Probably everyone in here knows this website, but I thought I would just put it up here anyway. All right. Employer attitudes. I think time, sometimes a lot of vocational rehabilitation counselors just wants to get someone a job. It's important, though, first to obviously listen to the employer. What does that employer need? What are they looking for? What is the demands of that occupation? You know, get to know that employer's needs. Probably be more willing to li listen to you. And you see, that's very important to mention because if you do have someone helping you to get a job and they go to a job site and they do a job site analysis, look at the culture, look at the environment, look at the essential functions of the job, see about accessibility and do this ahead of time, making sure it's a good match before bringing you for an interview, 
And obviously, if they know what the employer wants, the big thing is, if you go for the interview, they can tell you what the employer wants. So you have a greater chance at the interview getting the job. That's what matters. So market your uh, competitive strengths, your assets, provide education, create the win-win situation. Job accommodations, as I mentioned earlier, 80% according to the Job Accommodation Network, 80% is 500 or less cost for assistant technology, and a good chunk of that costs nothing. This could be a long topic just on this stuff. Reasonable accommodations, undo hardship. It has to be reasonable. It can't be too much burden for the employer. It has to make sense. Identification of essential functions. Okay, What are the essential functions? What are the marginal functions? The essential functions in the ADA, you have to be able to do the essential functions of the job. Can they be restructured? Can you do the essential functions maybe a different way? Can they be analyzed and see if that can be worked out and still produce the result and still get the job done? Okay. One good way to figure out if it's an essential function is if you took a core part of that job away, would that job still exist? Okay. You might be able to negotiate marginal functions, but essential functions be pretty hard. Environmental accommodations, user preference and ability. How many times, you know? Figure out the assistant technology. But if it's not something you want to use, it's not going to work. You know? Support and employment. Boy, that's a big topic I won't spend too much time on. Basically, it's an approach that has following components. There's a job developer that helps you find a job, works with you in a partnership, making sure that it's a right, good job match. Job site, job analysis should be done. Talk to employers, negotiate, and uh, make that match and, and uh, work with you. And some people have a job coach to help them learn the tasks and master the tasks and to negotiate some other things. Provide education. Well, you know, basically some, a lot of people don't know about assistant technology. Employers don't know about assistant technology. You might have to propose a couple assistant technology ideas. Okay. Let's see here. And that's the end. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Uh, my name is Tracy Zajac, and I'm a vocational rehabilitation counselor at the Linwood DVR office. And I'm going to be talking about DVR a little bit later, but um, I'm a spinal cord injury myself. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my life after my injury. I was injured in 1979 when I was 16 years old in a car accident. It's an incomplete injury, and I was actually walking for the first six years after my accident. didn't really think of myself at that time as a person with a disability. I walked with the forearm crutch, no braces or anything like that. And then six years later, I kind of got a wake-up call. I was losing my mobility, thinking I was just lazy or whatever. Went to the doctor. It was right when MRIs first came out. I found out that I had um, a subarachnoid cyst in my spinal cord. The doctor said, oh, you know, don't worry about it. I'm going to do surgery. You'll be fine. And I kind of had an experience like Dr. Mm -hmm. Steen's where I walked into surgery and didn't walk out. I was supposed to be in the hospital for 10 days. Ended up being in the hospital for six, uh, 10 weeks. So I basically had to do my rehab twice. First time wasn't so bad because I knew I was going to walk. One problem. Second time was a little bit more difficult because I thought, you know, I'm going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Um, the one thing that, that really um, helped me get through it was uh, I started working. I lived in Kansas City and I started working out at the Rehab Institute in Kansas City and I met this fellow who had just gotten um, back from doing the Detroit Marathon. And I thought, oh, that sounds like something fun to do, even though I'd never, I'd, I was a swimmer in high school. I didn't do track, I hated to run. Um, but sound like fun, and I got into wheelchair road racing. I was pretty successful in wheelchair road racing, went to two Paralympics. I'm not sure if you guys know what that is, but it's like the Olympics of um, people with physical disabilities. Went to uh, Korea in 1988, and then Atlanta in 1996. Um, it just really helped me, um, helped me identify who I was, and that I did have value. Um, and, it, you know, it was a wonderful part of my life. And, um, ended up moving to San Diego. I started working on a master's degree in therapeutic recreation. Thought that's what I wanted to do. Worked at a, a rehab hospital there. Uh, developed a women's wheelchair basketball team. Um, I played on the team. I was really awful. <laughs> it was really fun. <laughs> also got into wheelchair tennis. 
Again, pretty awful, but really fun, very social. And it's kind of fun to play tennis because it's something that you can play with your quote unquote able-bodied friends. Um, that and table tennis, really fun. But anyway, so um, kind of become a, uh, became a lifetime student. I went to travel agent school. I was a travel agent for about three months. I, <laughs> like I said, I was working on my master's in therapeutic recreation, got all my coursework done, my internship done, halfway through my thesis, decided that's not what I wanted to do. And then I decided I wanted to be a paralegal. I went to school to become a paralegal, decided I actually spent 10, uh, 15 years doing that. So that wasn't so bad. And then I'd always wanted to get my master's degree because I quit and I didn't finish it. I knew I didn't want to go into therapeutic recreation, but um, found out about DVR, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, decided I wanted to be a rehabilitation counselor. And um, I got my master's last year in that. And um, like I said, I skipped a lot of my life. <laughs> but two kids, getting married, divorced, all the stuff that, you know, able-bodied people do. So that kind of got incorporated into the, well, not get divorced. But <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so now I work at the Linwood um, DVR office, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So um, I think that um, Mike did a really good job about explaining what vocational rehab um, counselors do. I've been um, with DVR for about a year. I love it. My passion and DVR's philosophy is basically anybody that wants to work should have the opportunity to work. And that's what we try and do at DVR. We are employment oriented. We um, just feel that um, you know, work is such an important part of so many people's lives. I mean, when you meet a new person, what's the first thing that you say? Oh, what do you do? And for some people, it's okay to say, oh, I don't do anything. But for most of us, we feel like we want to be able to tell them something. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just you know, something that you enjoy, something that you want to do. And what we help people do is overcome their barriers to employment. So we are not an employment agency. We do not find you a job. We help you over, we help identify your barriers and help you overcome those barriers to employment. And we do it in several different ways. This is the, um, the process. Um, a person contacts DVR, we do an intake and an orientation. At that time, um, we have the person sign releases so we can get some medical documentation. You must have a documented um, disability, physical, um, mental, um, or mental. And then we have 60 days to determine your eligibility. Um, I don't know if a lot of you guys know about DVR, but DVR in Washington, we were under what was called the order of selection since 2000. And what that means is we had more people needing our services than we had money to provide those services. So what we had to do was establish a wait list. And at the height of our order selection, our wait list, we had 15,000 people on the wait list. And it just seems an impossible task to get everybody served that wanted to be served. Well, we got a new um, director about two years ago, and it was her mission to see that wait list go away. And so over the last 14 months, we've been working really, really hard um, to serve the people on the wait list and to get rid of it, and I'm really happy to say that last Monday was the last release from the wait list. So we are now, I guess we still have to be under, quote, order selection for, I believe, three more years, but we don't have a wait list. So that's a really good thing. We're trying to get the word out now because so many people are like, oh, I'd like their services, but I can't afford to wait five years. Or what's the point in even applying if I have to wait five years? I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I don't even know where I'm going to be living in five years. So um, the important thing to remember now is services can happen quite a bit sooner for people. We have 60 days now to determine eligibility. If you bring in your medical records to that orientation or the intake, we can get you um, eligible for services within a couple days and start and go and, um, you know, start in your services. And what we do is um, we put you in what's called an individualized plan for employment. We are client-centered and we have informed consent. So basically what we do is it, you work in partnership with your counselor. Your counselor doesn't tell you what to do. And unfortunately, you don't necessarily tell your counselor what you want to do. We talk about it, and you know, there's a meeting of the minds. We do a lot of research, and um, Steve was kind of talking about you know places like the 
um, occupational handbook where you can find jobs. And there's also other sources where you can find a lot of really good information about what you want to do. And we develop a plan, and um, that's where the bulk of your services come in. That's when we um, can start to provide services. Uh, we talked about eligibility. Um, sometimes we do assessments, um, either medical assessments to help deter determine your eligibility, or um, once you're in plan, we might do some vocational assessments, find out what your likes are, your dislikes are, um, your aptitudes and abilities. And these are some of the services that we can provide. Um, anything from counseling and guidance through retraining, we do um, sometimes provide retraining. Again, it has to be in partnership with your DVR counselor. And it has to lead to employment. That's DVR's goal is to get you employed in competitive employment. And um, let's see. So funding for DVR services, anybody is eligible for services, but we do, um, by uh, federal law, we do have to have you um, fill out a financial statement. So if you do want to go to school, we require you to uh, fill out the financial aid forms, and we, you need to provide us with a financial statement, and then we will um, supplement your unmet needs and things. So, And... We also help with job search. Some people don't want to go to school. They just want help with job search. And Mike did a really good job about talking about different kinds of job search. And also, um, we contract out for job coaching. We don't actually have job coaches that work for DVR. But um, we can hire out those services and things. And then after you find a job and you've been successfully employed for 90 days, then we close your case as successfully employed. And if um, any time after... Um, you become employed within three years. If something happens to your job and you need our services again, it's, you can come back to us. It's called um, post-employment services, and then we can help you again find a job. And uh, here's a number to find your local DVR office and um, some other websites. And I just wanted to let you know that I brought some information and some little freebies back there on the table. There's our annual report and um, some information, some pens and paper and things like that. And, Anyway, thank you guys for listening, and if you have any questions later, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. I got injured when I was 19, and uh, I was fairly active, um, pretty well motivated in what I wanted to do. I was going to school um, in New York, and... Um, um, I like doing physical things. Uh, I was a lifeguard in the ocean, and I finished my first triathlon, and it was decent in school and whatnot. And um, I got your cheat sheet, so yes. I'm going to use that. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, so then, um, you know, when I, uh, before I was injured, uh, like I said, I was uh, 19, and I did a lot of, uh, you know, ridiculous teenage things and uh, uh, among amongst them was uh, riding a motorcycle and uh, so I got injured uh, during that um, in, a, in an accident and I did my rehab uh, uh, initially at Mount Sinai um, in New York and then I came out to the UW uh, Medical Center on 8 North uh, for about five months out here and um, Basically, after, after that, I, I went through um, uh, a series of group homes and uh, nursing homes for a little bit at the time. And, um, you know, when I first got out of rehab, I really didn't do that much. I, I sat in my room all day uh, when I first got out of the hospital meeting. Um, and the group homes, I sat in my room all day and uh, just stared at the TV and, like, slapped half of the day because uh, I was in a lot of pain and... Um, I didn't want to. I didn't want to like deal with stuff, uh, but I slowly started reading a little bit online and getting back into doing things that I wanted to do. And um, it was definitely slow. It was uh, tedious. It wasn't at all glamorous. How did you find your goals? How did they precipitate for you in that kind of a life situation? I just kind of kept them in the back of my head, um, in the back of my mind. You know, maybe I'll go back to school. And I definitely had a lot of motivation uh, from people outside, uh, people um, that came to me in the hospital and said, hey, this, this person's going to school already, or hey, this person's uh, you know, volunteering or doing that. And 
it wasn't right for me at the time, but I kept it in the back of my mind, and um, I kept um, I kept the option open when the opportunity did come up to me. And um, yeah. what really made it happen for you? I mean, things are really taken off now. Yeah, I, I don't know if there was one defining moment, but um, there, were, like you said, the barriers. Uh, there were two main barriers for me that I'd I'd point out, and one was conditional um, in that, you know, moving here from New York and kind of having everything shaken up and uh, besides the injury and uh, group homes and whatnot. And there wasn't much I could do about that, but just kind of wait them out and um, uh, just wait um, and advocate for myself along with um, have other people advocate for me for a positive outcome. And um, the other main problem was motivation. Um, I really didn't want to do anything after I got injured. Um, I barely wanted to get out of bed, um, but people people pushed me along the way, and eventually that helped me push myself. And so, you know, it was it was one thing at a time, like getting out of bed for more um, than you know a few hours a day, and then it was you know getting out and doing some of my care, and then it was uh, you know taking the bus by myself, and so it was definitely a gradual process. Let me see. And so Nick pointed out some situations that were opportunities, but he didn't really see himself in them right away. Did you have some of those kind of episodes or situations that, you know, someone made a suggestion, but it was like not for you? Oh, definitely. I had lots of suggestions. People would always try to uh, ask me to just go down to the, the subway that's outside of 8 North. It's in, it's in the back there somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even when uh, the cute OT would ask me, I still didn't want to. I didn't get out do of my room. No, it didn't. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to close my windows and just watch TV and not really, not really deal with things. But like I said, people pushed me, and eventually, um, you know, it helped. It helped me overcome that mental barrier, um, saying that, okay, you know, I, I guess I could try that. And it kind of shifted from I can't do a lot of things to I could do some of these things, and I could do a lot of these things, and there's not much that I can't do with a little help. So it's kind of learned by doing, like, like, you know, on the motorcycle kind of a thing? Right. I right. see. You know, so, so you know, and, and that's very true. And, and, you know, and, and Groucho Marx was right. I mean, he said he, he wouldn't join any club who would have him for a member, you know, and, and, and that's it, you know. But, but with the experimentation, you can kind of test the club out a little bit. Yeah. You know, and that's right. I think that's, I'm up with that. Any other lessons or suggestions for, for us? I know you've got to go study, I hear. I do. I have a midterm tomorrow. Um, yeah, I brought like a couple of quotes, but I think they're too academic anyway. Well, I, throw one in. Just give us one of those. All right. Um, so I've actually been reading this book called Viktor Frankl, um, Man's Search for Meaning. And uh, it's about a, it's about a, a psychiatrist who was um, stuck in... Who, Concentration. concentration camp, Auschwitz. He lost all of his loved ones, and but he ultimately found meaning in that experience. And he quotes Dostoevsky when he once said, there's only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my sufferings. And Frankl continues, most men in a concentration camp believe the real opportunities of life had passed. Men, yet in reality, there was an opportunity and a challenge. One could make a victory of those experiences turning life into an inner triumph, or one could ignore the challenge and simply vegetate. And our stories are nowhere near as extreme, but you know, hopefully we'll be able to find our own meaning in our lives after SCI. Outstanding. And even in our title, we included that. I wanted to include giving back, something you know, dumb as that. But, but I interacted with a psychologist, and we, 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 we came up with that. So I'm glad it was there. And, you know, it's logo therapy in Victor Frankl. It's powerful, so I'd yeah. recommend that. All right, well, thank you. Sure. Sigrid, yeah. take it away. Okay. Want we'll to start about talking about before your injury? Um, well, before my injury, I worked for Nordstrom. I was a department manager for individualists at Northgate and recently promoted to Bellevue. And then I got a wild hair and decided to quit because I was going to be a ski bum and I was going to move to... New Zealand and be a nanny so I could ski all year. So um, spent Christmas with my family, was going to leave for 
New Zealand, and on December 26th, I was run over by a drunk driver. So um, mm. I didn't get to be a nanny or a ski bunny, and I had all sorts of new ski equipment that never got used. It was very sad. Yeah. But some people say, it's hard to believe, that the spinal cord injury is the best thing that ever happened to them. Well, maybe, I mean, it could be. You never know. Yeah. I'm still trying to find out the answers. <laughs> but I do have to say, after years of being disabled, life isn't as bad as I dreamt it was. When I woke up, well, I was never unconscious when I was hit. I was there when they cut off my clothes, and thank God I was wearing good underwear. You know, when your mother says to always wear clean underwear, no Nordstrom. wear it. Let me tell you. They cut your clothes right off you, <laughs> put you on that straight the, thing, and I mean, I never right. lost consciousness. So, But I really thought that um, I didn't think I'd live this long being disabled. It never occurred to me that I would, but I'm glad I'm still here, and I'm having a lot of fun. Now, what are your secrets? I mean, you're doing a lot. Talk a little bit more about what your life is like now. I do a lot, so then I don't think. <laughs> it's like, because I don't know what I want in my mind. Um, the busier you are, the less you are to be sad and depressed and go, why me? What am I going to do? I just have to get out and do something. I don't care what it is. I say yes to just about anything. And um, that was how it was when I spent six months at the University of Washington and then six months in a nursing home. And then I got an opportunity to do some experimental surgeries and went to Texas for a while, came back, and everybody thought I was going to move home with my mom, and that's not happening. So um, <laughs> I um, had to get a job. It was either move in with mom or get a job. Tough well, choice. obviously, I was getting a job. <laughs> and um, I also needed insurance and a lot of other things because my money was running out. So... Um, I put on a suit. Well, I didn't. My caregivers put a suit on me. And I went back to Nordstrom and interviewed for a job. And at that time, it was 1994, Nordstrom the Catalog had just started, hmm. which was a call center job. But it was fashion. It was Nordstrom. It was something I was good at selling. Mm -hmm. So I started. Um, we didn't have much accessibility back then. So... Nordstrom being Nordstrom, they had someone meet me at the door to let me in. When I had to go to the bathroom, there was a certain person whose job was to be a walker. If anyone needed help, you know, ask a question, mm -hmm. do stuff, talk to her. So when I had to go to the bathroom, she had to come with me to open the doors. Um, things have changed now. We have automatic door openers, and we're very high five. Yeah. But that's how it started at the beginning, and... After a year and a half of answering phones, I um, saw a need for a new opportunity that Nordstrom didn't see. But after I sold them on my idea, they thought it was great and hired me as the resource desk. The resource desk was the question and answer gal for the history of Nordstrom, fashion terms, fabric questions. Ask me a question, I'll get you an answer. And um, it became a department, and I was... Not a manager, I was a leader of the department. Didn't get the 33% discount, <laughs> but that's okay. 33%? Yeah, managers get a 33% discount at Nordstrom, and everybody else just gets 20 Okay. But that's all right. It saves me money. Anyways, after that, um, I moved into vendor relations, and I found the best thing for me is to create your own jobs and things. You have to start out with something you don't like. Mm -hmm. And then you just make it, you know, fish. what you want. It's like, I, you know, you go to Goodwill, you find a skirt, and it's kind of ugly, but you like the fabric. Take it to alteration, revamp it up, mm -hmm. you've got a great-looking outfit. I like that. We do that with plastic You can do that with surgeries. jobs, you know. Yeah. Try to do it with people. Sometimes I don't like it when I try yeah. to clean them up, but I do my best. Any other suggestions before we move on to Cody? The suggestions I have is never, you know, to give up. No, just think outside the box. You have to be stubborn and flexible at the same time. You can't let go of your goals of to get a job and to have fun, but you have to think of creative ways to do the same job or the job you want. Because it's out there, you just have to think it and make it work. 
Uh, well, before the injury, I, uh, I was a pastor uh, working full time as, uh, as what we call a worship leader at my church, which means I, uh, I was up in front of the church every week playing, uh, playing guitar, playing mm -hmm. violin and singing and leading a band, a pretty contemporary band. Played a lot of rock and roll about God. And, mm -hmm. um, I like that. It's like thunder. Yeah, kind of like that. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, I was also going to school part-time. Uh, and I'd been doing that for about, about four years, uh, working and going to school as a pastor. And uh, on July 28th, 2007, uh, I was stopped at a, a stoplight uh, on an on-ramp in a uh, Datsun 240Z that I'd spent six months bringing back to life. Yeah. And some guy uh, wasn't paying attention and rear-ended me going about 60 miles an hour in his uh, F-250 full-size truck. So wow. uh, I went to Harborview, spent a month and a half there. I like that noise. Mm -hmm. I spent a, a month and a half there in Four West in rehab and uh, had C5... Four, five, and six um, fused with two rods and six pins, and uh, and yeah, it's been about a little over six months since now, that day. Now, how are you putting things together now? I mean, they've connected your spine, but what about your life? Yeah, well, things suck. Mm -hmm. You know, life Tell is uh, life is really, really hard, and uh, a lot of things I have to do, and a lot of things I can't do. It's just really, really stupid, and it pisses me off and mm -hmm. uh, I'm angry you know probably all the time but but it doesn't always translate into uh, you know parking next to the wall and hitting my head against it I do a lot of uh, cursing mm -hmm. as I pray and, uh, <laughs> I try not to do it at God because I know he's stronger than me but uh, yeah I, 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 uh, I'm angry a lot and, and I'm also doing okay yeah. At the same time, it's uh, I'm 27 years old, and I've realized now that there's no good time to be injured. Mm -hmm. But 27 is an especially shitty time. Yeah. To be injured. You're right. Yeah, I was yeah, 22. Like, yeah. So, so Singer knows. And yeah. I was uh, I was a rock climber. I was a mm -hmm. uh, a road cyclist, and uh, I could kick ass, but uh, but I don't do that anymore. So <laughs> so. So things are things are going, you know. Yeah. They're they're not awesome. I don't love my life a lot of the mm -hmm. time, but but I'm really really excited about the fact that I'm actually still alive and that I didn't have a brain injury. Um, yeah. You know, I can actually move my arms. I can move my wrists. I'm not uh, um, I'm not completely paralyzed as some mm -hmm. of my friends are that I've met since that time. And uh, life goes on, you know. Yeah. I'm still me. Are there any windows opening up? You've got this boring peer group that you've kind of joined, you know, um, and any career possibilities or niches that are opening that you didn't necessarily see before? Um, I, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually probably going to go back um, and do a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, I'm probably a unique in the sense that... Uh, I have an ultra supportive group of 2,500 people mm -hmm. who want to give me money and mm. who want to do things for me. And uh, on top of that, my uh, my disability is actually credential uh, mm -hmm. in my career, in my job, my vocation. People uh, will actually listen to you. Some of us may have noticed um, just based on the fact that you're in a wheelchair. Um, and, and in my case, it's particularly true. So uh, I'm going to go back to... Being a pastor, and I'm going to do a lot of uh, the counseling, a lot of the uh, just um, spending time with people, helping them with their problems, yeah. um, which is what I used to do before. But uh, I'm going to do a lot more of that because I can't play guitar anymore. When so. you say your disability is credentialed, what's that mean? What, what do you mean? Uh, I just mean, uh, and I'm I'm just referring to my my vocation. Uh, people people really want to know what I have to say. Oh yeah. Um, just based on the fact I'm in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. I could be a complete idiot. But for some reason, they they want to listen to what I have to say. <laughs> I think uh, get more credibility. Yeah, exactly. Than a driving a Z necessarily. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of uh, it 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 
it doesn't prove anything except for the fact that you're going through something that's a lot harder than what yeah. they're going through, potentially. Yeah. And uh, that's all I mean by that. I got it. Yeah, cross the bear. That kind of, that's very good. I, I never thought of that that way, but that's true. Let's move on. Well, before my injury, I was um, pretty athletic. I played volleyball and I played softball for 13 years. I bungee jump and um, went dirt bike riding with my husband um, often. And but I also always thought I was a um, backyard gymnast, even though I wasn't a gymnast, which led me to um, my injury while vacationing in Chelan. I uh, was playing on the monkey bars with my teenage daughter and fell and dislocated my C6, C7 vertebrae, which uh, resulted in Asia, a complete injury. And um, and it was really hard because I was so athletic, so I bungee jumped from my ankles, I did everything, and then I thought, well, now I'm, now I'm stuck here in this chair. And um, I, I did my rehab here at the UW. I was here for three months. And um, when I got home from rehab, I didn't do much of anything for the first three years because I had multiple um, complications due to my injury and had 11 major surgeries in three years. So I didn't think I was ever going to have a life and leave the hospital. Became a VIP mm -hmm. here. I can go on any floor and say, hey, and, you know, <laughs> and recognized by many. Um, um, and some of the barriers I faced were that um, I didn't... I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want my friends, I didn't want to see the people I knew in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I, they knew me as this, as, as this, you know, healthy, athletic, vibrant person. And now I was sitting here getting fat, sitting in a wheelchair and um, didn't have my physique. It was, I was a little bit vain about it. I just, it was really difficult to um, get the first out of the way. Just once I saw people and they saw me in this big, huge contraption, then, you know, then I was okay. But it was a big barrier I faced. And, um, but while I was home for those three years and trying to recover and get healthy, I did a lot of research and, and I read a book that helped motivate me and um, went in to get me back in to be a member of society again. And it was a book by Dr. Scholler and the title is um, Tough Times Never Last But Tough People Do. Mm. And um, yeah, it's really good. I really highly recommend it. Um, other barriers are faced were nerve pain. I had a lot of nerve pain and um, I too have a subarachnoid cyst. It might be the same as you were talking about, a syrinx, which has been a little bit of the bane of my existence since my spinal cord injury, um, causing me complications and further disability and excruciating pain, which prevents me from going to work because I don't know that I'm going to be that reliable to show up all the time. I'm fatigued by it. But uh, I did know that... Um, I'm, I wanted to get back to be who I was and positive, outgoing, busy, and very hyper. And so I signed up to do the peer mentoring with the um, newly spinal cord injured patients, like with Anne, what Ann does here a couple of years ago. And, and I wanted to help back, get back to the, um, I guess, the medical community that's been so good to me. So I started volunteering at my local hospital two and a half years ago at the, just at the front desk, just saying hi to people, mm. help directing them where they want to go, try to make their pleasant, their visit there a little bit more pleasant. And then um, I just took off. I volunteered for the American Cancer Society. And this year my goal was to, like, as I said in my introduction, I want to work more with children to help break down the barriers and let them know that we are approachable. So I read with kindergartners, and I just started at the YMCA, and I absolutely love it. I feel like I belong to um, belong to something again, and that I'm contributing to um, to be a member of society again. Just because I'm not working, um, I am working. I'm just getting paid differently now. Would you explain about the YMCA? Because that's an interesting program with the exercise. Oh yeah, you know, and the, actually the YMCA has always been um, concentrated on uh, fitness, but they're also mm -hmm. sort of getting away from that and becoming a company and more about wellness. And so they offer a lot of wellness classes, nutrition, um, and, the, and, and they're just, it's amazing. They're so family oriented. They offer about a hundred programs. And actually right now they're, um, they're running some, um, a scholarship, uh, fundraiser for investing in the youth for, um, children, seniors, people with disabilities that can't, wouldn't be able to go there because they wouldn't be able to afford the membership because it's a little expensive. So, um, this way they can offer financial assistment, financial assistance. And so, um, I don't even have any kids in the program. I've already mm -hmm. donated, and um, and 
and am on one of the teams to try to um, raise raise some money for for the programs to help these kids with day camps and sports programs and everything throughout the year. Did you mention to me that there's a program that may come about where people would assist with exercise? Through the water, that was, okay. No, um, okay. I haven't. Right. I, and I just, I just okay. started there the first of the year, okay. so I. Um, yeah, but you know what? I am the first yeah. volunteer. I am one of the. Um, I'm the only person in a wheelchair, and they said they're really happy. So once again, to break down barriers, I can take pictures. I can tell them what the you know the mm -hmm. rates are. I can you know take mm -hmm. them on a tour. Any final comments or suggestions that you would have? Well. I would just, I would just say, uh, you know, take, you know, I didn't always accept that. I'm, I mean, I mean, I didn't always um, accept the being in a wheelchair, but you know, you do have to deal with it at some point. And um, and I found there was two ways to go. There was up or there's down, and down wasn't any fun. <laughs> Didn't want to go there again. So um, and 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 distraction and. Um, helps with um, the pain, helps, you know, exercise helps with the pain, and, um, and keeping busy just, um, just helps keeping me with a positive attitude. I'm Rob. I, you guys didn't hear from me earlier. Um, basically, a little over a year ago, I fell off a roof. I was building a home. I had a construction business. Very active guy. I, uh, sorry, always in the way. Um, worked out, lifted weights, golfed, anything that was active. So for me, that was a big loss. I couldn't do what I used to do. And with work, that was a very big loss. My body was a big source of my income. I used my brain too, but physically I worked hard was how I made my money. So I had no clue. I was just lost. And, and I guess kind of the, I mean, this is where you want mm -hmm. the transition was, I had to do something. I have a family. I have a little girl who's 19 months now. She was five months at the time. Awesome. So motivating. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, I want to be a role. I am a role model, but I want her to be. So your daughter motivates you. Just she, keep oh, going. Yeah, she motivates me. That inspires me to get out and do stuff. I've been where everybody has. You don't want to leave. It sucks. All your friends see you in a chair. You're totally different. It's not fun. But like you say, once you do it, you get over it. That's what you got to do. You got to get out and, you know, get up and, and move on. Yeah, the kids usually don't care too much. What are your plans for the future? I mean, you wanted to beat this and make some cash, you were telling me. Sure, yeah. I, beat it how? I mean, well, I mean, you know, I, I beat it because I, I mean, I, I accept it, but I don't, I don't dwell on it. I just move on. Life yeah. goes on. I don't just look at a chair and go, oh, okay, that's me. I'm yeah. stuck in it. I can still have a great life. Yeah. But you've currently turned your, your construction to financials. What you sure. Explain yeah. that to okay. the group. So basically, I don't build homes anymore. I help people purchase homes and I finance construction projects. Yeah. So it's been an, it's been a it was a difficult transition. I, I basically worked with my hands, worked outside, and now, I mean, I have a tie on every day. I work in an office. It's, it was crazy getting, getting started. It was very weird. Computers, I, I never turn on our computer once, and now I can type like, I mean, it's crazy. So I, it's, I've had to learn lots of new skills. Yeah. Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> Yeah, cool. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now let's go on to uh, our final panelist. That's outstanding. Start with before your injury and then take us all the way. Okay, well, let's see. Um, you might say that my life was sort of coming up roses at the time that I was injured. Um, I, had j I was 45 years old, and I had just fled corporate America, which I hated like crazy. I'd worked for 20 years in marketing communications and I was just sick of being a corporation. So I decided I was going to flee and I was going to start my own business and my passion in life has always been music so I thought well I'm going to help promote other musicians with my marketing background. Well I, I had this backache for about five months and it got worse and worse and worse and the doctor said you know you just have low back pain like tons of other people. Well it got a lot worse and um, finally one night uh, it was so bad um, that I couldn't urinate. And I called the doctor and they said, well, you know, go to the ER. Well, instead of going to here, which is where I should have mm -hmm. come, I went to a small hospital. They didn't know what was wrong with me. They put me to bed, pumped me full of morphine. Next morning, I was a paraplegic because I had a disc rupture into my spine. So they don't really know why it happened. It just happened. 
So yeah. I think that, you know, the first question that people sometimes ask when they get injured, at least I did, was why? You know, why did this happen to me? Mm. And I wasn't in an accident. I didn't do something scary or, you know, it just happened. So that made it kind of even harder to deal with. Is this cosmic, you know, is it my karma or whatever? Um, but um, so for about the first three years, I sat around. And I just felt sorry for myself and I didn't take care of myself. I overate. I smoked cigarettes and just, you know, abused myself. And we had a couple of family crises at the same time. So life was really hard, and my husband was going through some stuff. But thank God I did have my husband and my family because it, I'm alive today because of him. I know that for that love. Don't forget that. You've got to have your yeah. fan committee. If you don't have family, you know, go out and find a support group. Mm -hmm. Find other people in chairs. You need support. You mm -hmm. really need that around you and find it wherever you can and don't be afraid to ask for help and when you're out in public don't be afraid to ask for help either because most people able-bodied people to help they feel good about it right. you know it's like you're giving something to them yeah. so you meet your best friends that way yeah you do you do um, so uh, how I got back is uh, I started with a pain research study here at the U because I have chronic pain and uh, like Stephanie mentioned, and uh, it was just hanging over my head all the time. I didn't know how to deal with it. It was, it was just ruling my life. And through this study, I learned how to deal with pain. And one of the biggest things was to keep yourself busy. Mm -hmm. Set yourself goals every day, even if they're little goals, you know, like, you know, clean the floor today or, you know, clean your bathroom or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but just set yourself goals and keep busy. And then after that, I went into another research study with a wonderful rehab nurse named Kathy Worms, who's here. And it was an exercise study. And she got me into exercising. Well, when I started exercising and I got into that regular routine, then I decided I was going to join Weight Watchers because I had gained a lot of weight. I was almost 200 pounds. Mm. Yeah, sitting around, eating candy. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so I joined Weight Watchers, and after two years, I lost about 60 pounds. And then I started feeling a lot better about myself, uh, and I felt more independent. Um, I finally got a driver's license, so I was able to drive myself around and become independent. Yep. yep. And um, then my husband and I formed a band, <laughs> because we both, we're both musicians, and uh, we did the fairs and festivals circuit for like three years. Um, and we're kind of on hiatus right now because we just moved, but we're probably going to do that again mm -hmm. soon. But I got up on stage and performed really for the first time in my whole life. And I think being in this chair helped me because it was like nobody's going to boo a woman in a wheelchair, you know? <laughs> <laughs> even if she sucks. It's your ticket. You know? <laughs> that's good. It's your ticket to success. So, We've heard that twice. I yeah, like that. Yeah. So, so, and that's my passion. I love music. I write songs. Um, and I love to perform. Um, and uh, then a couple years ago, uh, at one of these forums, it was a forum on women's issues, and here was a whole room full of women in wheelchairs. And my friend Tammy Wilbur and I looked at each other and went, this is an opportunity. So we got a bunch of email addresses, and we started this email list. And our group now has 50 members. And we, have, we don't have meetings, per se, but we do have gatherings. We had a picnic. We've had a couple parties. Um, this coming Saturday, we're going to have a little get-together at a restaurant. And it's a social thing, but it also is a very, it's very supportive for, especially newly injured women. They come to our group and they say, you know, I haven't been out of the house. I didn't want anybody to see me in the chair. And I see all you women, I'm inspired. And it just, it fills your heart mm -hmm. when that happens and you hear that from someone. It's so wonderful.